I'm a PhD student at Texas A&M University, like Paul said. Um, I did my master's a few years ago on Western chicken turtles, and I'm almost finished with a PhD on the species. We began working with them in 2015, and uh, now we're working with the state to see what we can learn about the species long term. So what the heck is a chicken turtle? Um, when some people see a chicken turtle for the first time, they say, oh, so a regular turtle. Uh, but I can assure you these guys are far from regular. Their habits and habitat are very unique. Uh, chicken turtles are amidids, so similar in size and shape to your typical red-eared sliders, map turtles, and cooters. They have these big yellow bars on their front legs. Um, they can range from kind of dull to bright. Um, they can be really pretty with some of these, you know, some of this orange coloration. Uh, the Latin name reticularia comes from this net like pattern on the carapace um in texas they have this weird three-eyed smiley face pattern on the side uh, but they're very different from the other amidids in their habitat requirements habits and physiology uh, they have super long necks with a modified hyoid so that they can use suction feeding to actually suck in their prey they eat live crawfish and other invertebrates and probably tadpoles and other things that are abundant in ephemeral wetlands there's a pretty wide sexual size dimorphism. Here we have the uh, smallest and largest mature males from our sites, scaled with the smallest and largest mature females. So you can see there's a big difference in size between an adult female and an adult male. They like these shallow, gently sloping, heavily vegetated wetlands that dry up at least every year or two. Um, all of their feeding and mating occurs in, within these wetlands, but they also do this weird thing where they leave the water and move away from the wetlands to bury underground for estivation. In Texas, they're underground for most of the year. If it's wet enough the next year, they return to the wetlands, usually from March to June, but the activity season can vary depending on conditions. When they estivate, they bury completely under the soil with no burrow cavity or tunnel. Uh, there are three subspecies, the eastern, western, and Florida chicken turtles, and genetic studies suggest a deep split between the western chicken turtle and the other two subspecies. We are now collaborating on a phylogenetic study with Missouri State University to look at species-wide genetics and morphology. Now, in spite of the fact that a lot of their range is in Texas, prior to our work with uh, NRI and TPWD, there were no studies on chicken turtles in Texas, and a lot of other turtle studies within their range in Texas just haven't been capturing them. Another thing to note about their range is that it's under major urbanization threat, being so close to Houston, Dallas, and all the other towns in between. For those reasons, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has decided that listing the western subspecies might be warranted. So. We partnered with TPWD in uh, 2018 to work on some uh, long-term studies. We've published some of this research in peer-reviewed journals, but we've also completed several studies not listed here that are being revised for submission. The first study was in Journal of Herpetology on survey protocols for the species. It basically asked how, when, and where you should survey for chicken turtles in Texas. During that study, we used dipnet surveys, SANE surveys, night waiting surveys, uh, and two types of unbaited fight trap. We found that all of those methods uh, captured chicken turtles, <clears throat> but there was demographic bias among methods. Some caught larger individuals and some smaller. The unbaited fight traps were the most even demographically. Uh, we also used some telemetry to look at the water depth and uh, found that they spend a lot of time in depths shallower than most traps. So we've since de developed ways to trap shallower. They spend most of their time at about one foot deep. So this is a very, this is a species that likes very shallow water. Um, and then because in some places road and trail surveys are the only option because, uh, because of all the private land in Texas really, um, we also used GPS loggers, game cameras and telemetry to identify terrestrial movement times and found that terrestrial migrations peaked in June and movements over land were mostly diurnal, peaking daily around 11 a.m.
We also use telemetry and variation in capture rates over time to identify when they're in the water because there's no point in trapping when all of them are underground. We found that in Texas, they slowly begin entering the water after winter rain refills the wetlands, uh, but the capture rates are highest from mid-April to mid-June. Some of this aquatic activity season data was supported by our next study on fecundity female maturation and nesting season. In that study, females started producing eggs at around 16 and a half centimeters and individuals laid seven to 11 eggs per clutch. They nested in the spring during peak aquatic activity. Um, we didn't see any evidence of the bimodal nesting season that they've witnessed in the species on the East Coast. Um, in support of some of this activity pattern work, uh, we just had a new paper accepted presenting preliminary data on a new method of detection for the species. Basically, you have two logs that can float up and down on these pipe runners, and you stick a game camera in the middle and let it run through the season, and it works. Um, you get a lot of rendered sliders, but we've also documented 2,266 basking events from chicken turtles so far. And the basking trends align with our other aquatic activity pattern data. So this will provide some great information moving forward, especially on activity patterns. Here's three basking chicken turtles and a uh, fourth climbing on. Um, we've published a few short communications on potential sources of mortality for the species. One was on attempts by predators to dig them up and eat them while they're estivating underground. In these cases, even if the predator doesn't succeed, it can induce untimely migration from estivation sites. Uh, we also published a note on the effects of disking. Disking is a popular technique in ranching and in the management of ground nesting birds, but can severely injure or kill chicken turtles and probably other fossorial species that are living underground. Uh, at one wetland we monitor, there's disking pretty regularly. And to date, we've found one dead one, six with major shell injuries, and uh, two that prematurely left estivation sites that had been disked. Uh, but since they're underground when estivating, we have no idea how many die underground by getting disked because we don't find them. The remains of dead turtles would stay underground. Uh, we published another short communication with some naturalists from Houston on turtle prey specialization in crested caracaras. Uh, we made some observations of pairs of caracaras killing adult red eared sliders and our co-authors found this caracara nest where beneath the tree were the remains of 50 vertebrate prey items, 43 of which were turtles. Each of these pink flags is a turtle. Um, none of these were chicken turtles, but they found the remains of adult chicken turtles along a fence line about 20 meters away. Caracaras are very common in the prairies where uh, chicken turtles seem most abundant and uh, could be a source of mortality if they're specializing in turtle prey items. Now, those preliminary studies um, and observations uh, provided a baseline understanding of, of a species we knew little about within our state. But to establish long-term research and conservation protocols, we needed to identify both the appropriate geographic scale for study and monitoring and the appropriate scale for conservation and management uh, prescriptions. And that brings us to the primary focus of today's presentation. Um, synthesizing our research in a way that we can identify the appropriate scales for research and management in this species. The way I see it, chicken turtles can be studied at three primary scales. You have the pond scale where you find a uh, nice wetland that has chicken turtles in it. And then you study the crap out of the turtles in that one wetland and the uh, surrounding upland buffer where they estivate. And then you have the site scale or property scale where you study a network of wetlands and the upland matrix in between them, usually bound by whatever property boundaries you have access to. And then you have the landscape scale, where you're studying a regional network of sites, the differences between them, and the connectivity between them. To work with the species on multiple scales, we had to perform multiple studies answering a variety of questions. At the pond scale, we looked at microhabitat use within wetlands, and then the estivation habitat selection within upland buffers. Then at the site or property level, we could look at differences between the wetland structure of entire ponds, differences in multi-species turtle assemblages among ponds, how the turtles moved across the property, 
whether individuals are using the same wetlands over time and whether they're estimating in the same areas, then hopefully we could use mark and recapture studies to uh, estimate detection probabilities, survival, and abundance. At the landscape scale, we could look at differences in the habitats available at each property, as well as differences in the chicken turtle populations at each property. Use historic occurrence data on the species within the state to create a regional distribution model predicting presence of the species across the landscape. Use connectivity analyses to identify important pathways for gene flow and dispersal across the landscape. And collect blood samples from multiple populations to look at actual connectivity among populations across the landscape. But let's look at this pond scale. You've got a wetland that has chicken turtles in it. Chicken turtle ponds are shallow, but you're going to have some variation in water depth. You'll also have natural variation in plant density or even some areas that are open water with no vegetation, right? Um, and then you have differences in the kind of plants that live in the wetlands. You have these emergent herbaceous plants like horned beak sedge that are maybe rooted in the bottom or floating with roots that trail down to the bottom. And then you've got these submerged aquatic plants or even algae that are just suspended in the water column. Most of these plants are pretty filamentous, almost like masses of hair. Um, and then you've got these emergent shrubs like rattlebox that maybe grow from one thick stem, but branch higher above the surface of the water. So we did tons of trapping in wetlands with chicken turtles, recorded the water depth of each trap and percent cover of each type of plant in, along a uh, you know one meter strip along the fight trap. The blue dots are traps that caught chicken turtles and the red traps didn't. What this PCA shows us is that within these wetlands, individuals are not selecting specific areas based on the vegetative structure at those spots. Basically, in wetlands that are suitable for chicken turtles, they're often using the entire wetland. And there's not much selection happening at the microhabitat scale within each wetland. So then we tracked a bunch of turtles to their upland estivation sites and recorded the percent cover across similar groups of plants, as well as the distance from the nearest edge of the wetland. We noticed that the microhabitat used by individuals seemed to be similar to what was available in the uplands at each property. We had one site in Waller County, one in Harris County, and a third at a remnant prairie nestled in the Piney Woods in Nacogdoches County. And the habitat used seemed similar to the basic structure of each of those sites. So in Nacogdoches County, we also collected available habitat data. Each one of these green dots is an estivation site actually used by a chicken turtle. And at each yellow dot, we collected microhabitat data to compare what they were using to what was available at the site. We found that the only apparent difference between the available and utilized sites was in distance from the wetlands. So basically, sites were a function of distance from the pond and not selected for specific characteristics. We found them in closed canopy forest, open grasslands, savannas, under dense yopon, estivation sites varied. And what this indicates is that habitat selection may be better studied on the macro habitat landscape scale. Differences between wetlands and broader upland landscape characteristics between properties may be better predictors of presence than fine scale microhabitat details. While we were tracking turtles, we also looked at estivation distance from wetlands to identify an appropriate buffer size and learned that a buffer of 400 meters around each wetland would have protected all estivating individuals. But if you look at the wetlands that had chicken turtles at all three properties, there's less than 400 meters between a lot of these wetlands. The ones with letters have documented chicken turtles. Here's a property in Harris County, Nacogdoches County, and Waller County. So leaving an upland buffer around one wetland may not be near as beneficial as just preserving the mosaic of multiple wetlands and the upland in between. What all this indicates is that even management may be better approached on a landscape scale. So scaling up to this sort of property level scale where you have multiple wetlands, we can compare characteristics of the wetlands. Here are the wetlands with more than 10 individuals at each property. Um, generally, the wetlands where we're catching lots of chicken turtles are less than two meters deep. They're very gently sloping, so they're huge in area, um, usually several acres. They're uh, mostly vegetated <clears throat> with very little open water, and they're very ephemeral. 
uh, where by the end of the chicken turtle activity season, they're drying down to less than one fourth of the area that's inundated uh, when the wetland is full. Uh, most of these dry down to nothing by the fall. Another thing we can look at when comparing wetlands is turtle assemblage data. We're still working on this, but uh, looking at raw total capture data, we have seven wetlands here with chicken turtles in yellow, snappers in light orange, mud turtles in dark orange, and sliders in red. The general trend with this preliminary data is that wetlands with higher chicken turtle capture rates also tended to have higher mud turtle to slider ratios. This might indicate that chicken turtles have a greater overlap in the multi-dimensional uh, niche space with mud turtles than sliders. Uh, it makes sense because both mud turtles and chicken turtles estivate underground and are adapted to ephemeral wetlands that dry up. Uh, it could also mean that if there's less overlap with sliders, then wetlands more suitable for sliders are less suitable for chicken turtles. We'll revisit differences between wetlands uh, later in the presentation. Another thing you can look at on this site scale or property scale is movements. If you have more than one suitable wetland, and they're close together, closer together uh, at least than some individuals' estivation distances, uh, then it could make sense to ask whether they're moving between wetlands, if certain age classes or sexes are moving more often, and whether they have um, a group of repeat wetlands that they use over and over again or just wander around randomly from pond to pond. So for some of my masters, we had published this paper on spatial ecology um, in spatial ecology, we look at the size and shape of animal movements. Um, so most of the data we collected uh, was via telemetry, just sort of radio tracking individuals over time. And we found that they move a lot. This is one adult male's movements over one year. Uh, sometimes it's to go from one wetland to another, and sometimes it's to move to estivation sites on land, typically during drier periods. Um, we found that they can have these just massive home ranges. Uh, the movement stats were quite a bit longer than what was known previously for the species, uh, but we also learned that the mosaic characteristics within the individual's home range influence movement metrics, uh, and that the home range sizes for some individuals didn't asymptote. They just kept going up and up and up which can indicate either eruptive nomadism or partial nomadism, indicative of evol evolving on a much larger prairie pothole landscape, or just indicate that their home ranges can be much larger than the properties we have access to. We had several individuals at each site that wandered off the property eventually so far that they were out of radio contact. So even with the large seasonal ranges we were getting, we probably weren't mapping the largest ranges in the population. Um, you can see on this imagery from the 1940s that Houston used to be all prairie going right up to Spring Creek on the northern boundary of Harris County. But now it's either urbanized or converted to tallow forests and reservoirs. This orange shape is one individual's movements over a year, right? Uh, but the landscape used to have a much higher density of prairie pothole wetlands. Every one of these little black dots is a nice big prairie wetland. So over 10 years, who knows what this individual could have done on the natural landscape. But when you take a mosaic like this with lots of prairie and lots of wetlands, and you do this to it, you're going to see a reduction in movement. Now for the next two property level studies, know that we're recognizing four demographic classes of individuals. You have unsexed juveniles where you can't tell male from female, mature males, females that you know are female but haven't reached maturity yet, and mature females. We do this because of the difference in size between mature males and females. Males hit that maturation size earlier than females. So the next thing we looked at was uh, fidelity to wetland sites. We knew from the spatial ecology study that they move from pond to pond sometimes, but wanted to know, are some individuals using more wetlands, less wetlands, or going back to the same wetland after multiple estivation periods? We found that larger individuals tended to disperse to more wetlands, and that in the unsexed juveniles age, juvenile age class, uh, they had high fidelity to the same wetland across years. They do at least two seasons in the first wetland. Then we wanted to look at terrestrial site fidelity. For the individuals that used the same wetland at least twice, 
did they go estivate in the same area each time the wetland dried or was it random? This was interesting. Um, most individuals go to the same general area to estivate underground year after year, even if the wetland is surrounded by suitable habitat. We used maximum bearing widths to quantify directional fidelity um, here and at two other sites and found that direction was significantly different from random. So there's some terrestrial site fidelity or site memory. Next, we looked at population dynamics, which is a huge can of worms for this species. Um, these models can be data hungry. Uh, so we did lots of trapping, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of trapping. Um, across three sites, we performed over 1400 trap nights and had 759 captures of over 300 individual chicken turtles. Uh, we learned that there are a number of behavioral characteristics that confound parameters in population models. Many population models assume equal detectability among individuals and population closure, uh, that individuals aren't entering or leaving the population. Uh, this is a problem with chicken turtles because if they're doing anything other than swimming in the wetlands you are sampling, they're not available for capture. If they're estivating or swimming around in another wetland, uh, even if they didn't leave the population, they're not available for capture. Uh, this also presents a problem because larger individuals were more likely to go use other wetlands. It's possible that some of the chicken turtle studies that estimated high juvenile survival were confounding survival with high juvenile aquatic site fidelity. Another issue is that in the telemetry study, there was never a period where all individuals were in wetlands at all. There were always at least a few chicken turtles estivating and a turtle that's underground is not in an available state. In addition to these behavioral influences, we found that detection probability can be pushed around by other environmental, environmental and procedural factors. Um, <clears throat> we found that generally as temperature increases, individuals become more active within the wetland and more likely to wander into a trap, right? Uh, but we also found that as wetlands dry, individuals are more concentrated and more likely to go into a trap. But they're also more likely to leave the wetlands to go estivate as the wetland dries. These conditions pull detectability in two directions. You can also procedurally mess up detection probability. If you trap once and the wetland is full and trap again while the wetland's drying, the individuals are more concentrated. Similarly, if you use the same number of traps each time, then the trap density is much higher when the wetland is drying. Then if you trap multiple wetlands of the same size, but with different numbers of traps, the detection probability is different for individuals in different wetlands. And if you use the same number of traps for wetland, but the wetlands are different sizes, then detection probability is different. This graphic represents the biggest problem with detection probability, which is even if you have your ducks in a row and you perfectly match the trap density with the turtle density at e in each pond during each session, if you're not trapping in every pond used by the population, you have heterogeneity in the availability status and therefore detection probability of individuals. This is a huge problem for herpetological mark and recapture studies, even if they don't involve ponds or wetlands and applies if you're doing something like monitoring lizards where the population is larger than the area you're sampling um, or monitoring a riverine turtle species, but only trapping a portion of the river that they use. You're always going to confound survival with e-migration and, and probably underestimate survival. We ran a lot of population models and even multi-state open robust design models that account for some of these problems of temporary e-migration and uh, estivation changes in availability status. And every model grossly underestimated survival, indicating that we're geographically undersampling these populations. Uh, that means that even if we sample all these wetlands perfectly for many years with lots of data, we won't understand the population dynamics because of the wetlands that members of the population are using on other properties. We had similar results at all three sites. And this reinforces what we learned from the spatial ecology, habitat, and site fidelity studies uh, that we may need to uh, be studying these guys on a larger spatial scale. Now to do that, you can start by just looking for any obvious differences between the sites where you've been studying chicken turtles, right? 
So we were catching tons of them at a property in Waller County uh, where there's all this nice prairie upland with native plants and no grazing. And then in Harris County with lots of grazing and lots of invasive McCartney rose, this big woody shrub that grows in big masses like eight feet tall. And then we find them at this remnant prairie nestled in the East Texas Piney Woods that has open prairie, but also has grown up to a point that it has some savannas and dense forest. And they estimate throughout the place. Another thing you could look at to try and look for already apparent differences across the landscape is the turtles themselves. Um, we're still working on this, but it seems that at the remnant prairie in uh, the East Texas Piney Woods, they grow faster and to larger sizes than in the coastal prairie ecoregion. Uh, we don't know if this difference is because of maybe a slightly longer activity period or resources available or genetics, uh, but it's interesting that the morphology is a little different. Um, the next thing you can do with data already available is uh, regional distribution modeling, where you look at occurrence records for the species, the environmental characteristics where they were found, and try to predict where else they might occur within the ecoregions they occupy in Texas. Uh, we pulled data from several sources, gathering observations from our studies, uh, historic localities, and iNaturalist observations. Um, when gathering this data, you always have to check for coordinate typos from the original source, and you end up having to throw some of them out. Uh, some were duplicates and some were geographically ambiguous. Those issues can cause problems in modeling. Um, in this modeling process, you have to identify an appropriate scale or pixel size. We made a compromise between what we learned from the uh, spatial work that some individuals use a little network of wetlands, but then some had these multi-kilometer movements over land, um, and the data available. It was a compromise between the spatial information we already knew and the occurrence records available. We found that if we used a grid size of 1.5 kilometers, we, we retained close to 100 samples. And because of how it was aligned, we actually kept 114. Um, <clears throat> so within that grid size, we gathered a bunch of environmental data that might be important to chicken turtles, eliminated variables that were too highly correlated with each other or not correlated with presence, uh, and ended up with 11 variables that could be used to model probability of presence and these all make sense given the history of research on chicken turtles. You have a species that spends most of the year underground. So soil density and components like sand and silt probably matter. Coarse fragments are uh, chunks of pebble and rock in the soil. Um, <clears throat> it's a species that seems uh, adapted to prairies, right? So topographic variation and tree cover might help predict presence across the landscape. Um, they rely on ephemeral wetlands that dry up and refill. So climatic variables like precipitation seasonality, annual rainfall and temperature are probably important. Um, and then we know that they need a mosaic of wetlands within an upland area. So the number of ponds within a grid cell, as well as not having too much or too little wetland area, because they need the uplands too, right? Uh, might be important predictors of presence. To further affirm that these variables were important, uh, later in the modeling process, we did several jackknife procedures where we remove one variable and run a bunch of, a bunch of iterations um, and, and then average the results. The models were very similar, uh, showing that we would not benefit really from removing any of these variables. They were all important. Now, <clears throat> we trap in a lot of prairies. Um, we already filtered the data geographically so that we don't have too much bias from one network of ponds. Um, but we also used environmental filter, filtering to remove records that were too similar in this multi-dimensional niche space too close together. Um, that left us right at 100 samples to use in model construction. Uh, we used six algorithms to generate models, and although the random forest algorithm performed better on average, we used another jackknife procedure to run a bunch of iterations with each algorithm left out and uh, found that there wasn't much training gain in ensemble models when skipping any of these algorithms. Um, so to create a final ensemble model, we used 1,800 iterations, including 300 for each algorithm. Um, during each iter iteration, we used 85 randomly selected occurrence records, held back 15 records for test-dependent data partitioning, and uh, 300 randomly selected pseudo absence positions from cells that didn't have occurrence records. 
uh, to avoid biasing ensemble models toward algorithms that didn't perform as well, we scaled each algorithm so that the threshold probability was 0 0.5 and then weighted the algorithms proportionally to their AUC scores. Another thing we did to make the final ensemble model more practical is acknowledge potential resistance factors that may limit connectivity across the landscape using this post-processing mask. Here we've weighted, uh, we have weighted penalties for each pixel um, in the ensemble model um, for things like urbanization, row crop agriculture, salinity, and distance from known occurrence records. Um, so here's the weighted average across 1800 iterations after the post-processing mask was applied and everything. Uh, but let's look at this. So at first glance, the big strip of tall grass prairies bisecting Texas is well represented here. Uh, the coastal prairies and the Northeast Texas prairie remnants are represented. In East Texas, they're probably, there's probably a little too much bottomland floodplain uh, that we don't really think of as chicken turtle habitat. Um, we could probably add another post-processing mask that removes the floodplain, uh, but most of the occurrence records in East Texas have come from prairie areas directly adjacent to those bottomlands anyway. So this is probably fine. Um, we did some preliminary connectivity analysis with this model in CircuitScape, and uh, this model treats patches of habitat with scores higher than 0.75 as nodes in an electrical con conductivity uh, circuit. Um, you can see higher conductivity in the big strip of tall grass prairie, and then a little more isolation in East Texas, and then much higher node isolation in Northeast Texas. You can see all those little uh, white dots up there. Um, so at first glance, this looks pretty reasonable. That northeastern isolation trend probably continues into Oklahoma and Arkansas, where we know their habitat gets much more patchy. But what I thought was interesting was this. Um, it's rare to discuss western chicken turtles these days without someone bringing up the highly sympatric crawfish frog. Well, uh, we recently got some population genetics data on crawfish frogs in Texas, and it looked like they had fairly high connectivity in area one, a little less gene flow in East Texas, but then they were pretty isolated up in the Northeast, which matches this fairly well. Um, so we've got models predicting presence and landscape connectivity and some common sense sort of anecdotal support of them saying these look fairly reasonable, um, but we needed ways to verify them with real data, right? Um, so we said for the 2023 activity season, we're going to trap at a bunch of new properties with high predicted suitability and uh, look at any new iNaturalist or museum records to build an independent data set for model verification, right? And we're going to try to collect at least 10 blood samples at each property for a study on population genetics to see if the genetic structure matches this predicted landscape connectivity. So that brings us to 2023. Unfortunately, <laughs> there were no new INAT records for chicken turtles in Texas in 2023. There was one record from 2022 that wasn't included in the model calibration. That pixel had a probability score of 0 0.994. So we've, we've got that. And then we trapped in a bunch of new pixels and Paul at TPWD trapped in a bunch of new pixels. Uh, we trapped in nine counties, each county with a star in it. We trapped in 34 new pixels most of which had reasonably high probability scores. Um, however, only two of the new spots had chicken turtles, <laughs> leaving us with only three new pixels for the season. The scores were pretty high on those two, but uh, we also trapped some really high probability cells without catching chicken turtles. Now, we're used to going to sites like this that I showed you earlier and uh, spreading 15 to 20 fight nets across several wetlands, checking them for a few nights, uh, and catching 30 to 40 individuals. But here we were trapping at even more pristine uh, prairie preservation properties covered in Mima mounds, uh, with similar uplands and the same soils, and even in close proximity to prior observations, and not catching chicken turtles. So I'm going, crap, what's going on here? Well, you remember when I explained that what kind of wetlands chicken turtles like? 
Well, the distribution model was, models that we made took into account the number of inundated areas within each pixel and uh, the upland to wetland ratio. But there's not a great database, even in the National Wetlands Inventory, to identify these depth and slope characteristics that chicken turtles like. All wetlands are kind of treated equally by the model. So this map might be a de decent predictor of upland suitability. But the first thing we noticed about the pixels that had chicken turtles was that the wetlands were pretty similar in depth, slope, and seasonality to our usual chicken turtle sites. But the pixels that didn't have them mostly had deeper cattle tanks. Um, now, if you've ever bought land in Texas, especially prairie, odds are some prior landowner back in time used it for cattle ranching and did this thing where they find all the natural wetlands and dig them out uh, so that they're too deep for plants to grow. And they lose a lot of that original area. Uh, here's another example. You've got big shallow wetlands. You dig them really deep and they lose a lot of their original area. Uh, this is often done to every wetland on the property. Uh, they either dig them into deep cattle tanks uh, or drain them with irrigation ditches. This is that same property and you can see there's much less water on the landscape. Uh, the original wetlands have either been dug into cattle tanks or drained by ditches. We see some of this at the sites where we have a bunch of chicken turtles too. Here's a deep cattle tank in an area loaded with chicken turtles and we've caught tons of turtles in here but never chicken turtles. Here's another one, same deal. This one's in sort of a triangle of, oh, this one's in sort of a triangle of three wetlands loaded with chicken turtles, um, but we've never caught caught one in here, um, and we've never had a radio turtle move into here, even though it's in between a bunch of uh, wetlands with chicken turtles. We caught tons of sliders in here. Um, so this is kind of a bummer, right? Like, uh, you know. Chicken turtles have already lost tons of habitat to urbanization. Um, this is actually Sharptown in the Sharpstown in the 1940s. Um, this is Sharpstown now. Um, this is what Cyprus looked like uh, in Cyprus now. Um, even Houston, most of the Houston area was prairie with all these nice big shallow wetlands. All these tiny dots are prairie wetlands. Um, but there's Houston now. This is all kind of depressing, right? Because now we're looking at it going crap. Even if we leave the cities and go to these nice prairie properties, uh, most of the wetlands in Texas have been turned into cattle tanks anyway. If chicken turtles only remain in a handful of places, they have no hope. Um, but then I remembered something. One time back in 2021, we tracked a chicken turtle to a wetland that was man-made and less than three years old. They had excavated it in 2018 as part of a Ducks Unlimited project. And while we were there tracking that turtle, we found another chicken turtle that was a new unmarked individual. Seeing this brand new wetland to track chicken turtles made me think about the history of the sites where we find tons of chicken turtles. And I realized that uh, the wetlands at all three of the sites we monitor are mostly man-made and really not that old. These were built as Ducks Unlimited projects. Uh, these were Ducks Unlimited projects. And then uh, up in East Texas, these are pretty new too. Um, they were constructed for duck management in the early 2000s. Um, all three of those properties have a bunch of chicken turtles, but none of them look like this. Um, now chicken turtles are going through the listing process. If they get listed as threatened or endangered, they're gonna need a recovery plan. It would be awful to go to all the effort of protecting them and then lose them to extinction anyway. So it's good to know that they, they may not be one of these species that requires some hyper-specific pristine habitat that we're rapidly running out of. Um, the three sites where we study them regularly are proof that you can have robust populations using a bunch of wetlands that are man-made um, and really not that old. Um, if the species does get listed, uh, one pa possible pathway to uh, recovery uh, might be to finish the population genetics work. We have one year left on that um, and identify some evolutionarily significant units. You know, maybe they'll look similar to those of the crawfish frog that we looked at earlier. And then within each unit, use a map like this to identify suitable uplands and find property owners with overlapping goals. Maybe they want to construct duck hunting wetlands to make more money from hunting leases. Uh, 
maybe they just have prairie restoration goals. They have these nice uplands and they, they just want to create big ephemeral wetlands because they, they were a natural feature of the prairie landscape. In some places, cattle tanks could even be converted back into ephemeral wetlands. Um, there are organizations like the Coastal Prairie Conservancy who are trying to bring Texas back to its natural state. Um, and we want to keep Texas, Texas, you know, management for chicken turtles probably requires preservation of prairie uplands and the creation of suitable wetlands because the cattle tanks on former ranching properties probably aren't going to cut it. Um, both the study of chicken turtles and management prescriptions require effort at both the landscape and property scales. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for listening to me talk for an hour. Um, I know it was long, but I'm really focused on using research and conservation in practical ways that actually work. Uh, so if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, I'm all ears. We have quite a bit of time.